Hello, today we're going to talk about anterior primary tooth pulpectomy techniques, diagnosis, and primary pediatric zirconia crowns for the anterior teeth. The teeth we're looking at today are ears and Edward, which has a mesial and sizal facial lingual caries and a periapical radial lucency, and F is in Franklin, which has mesial, facial, and sizal lingual caries. You can appreciate that E is in Edward has a periapical radial lucency and abscess. I did offer the parent extraction of tooth number E, but they were very motivated to try and save the tooth, which is why we offered pulpectomy. Going back to Cole's use of non-vital pulp therapies and primary teeth from pediatric dentistry, we're going to follow our flow chart of a healthy child with deep caries or dental trauma in primary teeth. Our pulpal diagnosis is either going to be vital or non-vital. In the case of the abscess tooth, we have a necrotic pulp and then due to the parent's motivation we did want to attempt pulp therapy is it restorable i would say this tooth is restorable yes is there a root resorption external internal i would say there is a minor amount of root resorption where a pulpectomy can still be achieved so our goal is going to be a pulpectomy with a pediatric zirconia crown that is full coverage and cemented update to their 2016 publication. Cole et al. still found that in primary teeth that had deep caries affecting vital incisor, a pulpotomy had significantly greater success than a pulpectomy. These would be in teeth that are not necrotic and not hyperemic. Now we're going to look at the actual technique and research behind non-vital pulp treatment for primary teeth diagnosed with irreversible pulpitis or a necrotic pulp. So what is a pulpectomy? A pulpectomy is a root canal procedure for pulp tissue that is irreversibly inflamed or necrotic due to caries or trauma. The root canals are debrided and shaped with hand or rotary files and then irrigated with a solution. After the canals are irrigated, they are dried with paper points and a resorbable material such as non-reinforced zinc oxide eugenol, ZOE, an iodoform-based paste or a combination paste of iodoform and calcium hydroxide is used to fill the canals. The tooth is then restored with a restoration that seals the tooth from micro leakage. Clinicians should evaluate non-vital pulp treatments for success in adverse events clinically and radiographically at least every 12 months. So let's take a look at comparison of techniques. This is from the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, pulp therapy for primary and immature permanent teeth, and also from a Cole study on a systematic review and meta-analysis of non-vital pulp therapy for primary teeth. When assessing rotary versus utilization of hand files, it was found that rotary instrumentation only decreases the actual instrumentation time by approximately two minutes, and it tends to result in more flush fills with your interpulpal medicament. This is an example of me using two bar brooches to remove the pulp out of an anterior tooth. If I hand file, I'll typically only hand file up to an O2 35K flex. This is me removing the pulp with a rotary instrument. This is on a primary anterior tooth with minimal cleaning and shaping required. When assessing sodium hypochlorite versus calcium hydroxide, a recent systematic review showed no difference in success when irrigating with chlorhexine or 1-5% to sodium hypochlorite or still water or saline. This is an important aspect to focus on because sodium hypochlorite must not be extruded beyond any of the apical tissues. When looking at obturation medicaments, success with pulpectomies performed with zinc oxide eugenol and with endofloss, which is zinc oxide eugenol plus iodoform plus calcium hydroxide, did not differ from that observed from using Vitapex or Metapex. Endofloss in ZOE success rates did remain near 90% versus 71% or less for iodoform. So a network analysis rating showed that endofloss in ZOE performed better than iodoform alone. So at the end of this larger study, 18 month success rates supported endoflas and zinc oxide eugenol pulpectomies over iodoform pulpectomies. I still think all three potential medicaments can be successful.
So what did Cole's systematic review and meta-analysis of non-vital pulp therapy for primary teeth show? That the obturation method, number of treatment visits, method of root length determination, irrigation solutions, smear layer removal, or the timing and type of the final restoration did not impact the success rate of pulp Ectomies, meaning that there really isn't a best way and all accepted clinical ways of performing this procedure can be successful in the right patient. Now we're going to take a look at the characteristics of crowns, roots, the pulp, and root canal systems in the primary dentition. We're going to be looking at a study by Cleghorn titled Primary Human Teeth in Their Root Canal Systems that was published in Endodontic Topics in 2012. Looking at crown forms, the crowns of the primary dentition are shorter relative to the length of the root. Smaller crown to root ratio. The occlusal tables of primary molars are constricted buccolingually and much narrower mesiodistally when compared to the permanent molar. Enamel and dentin are thinner compared to permanent teeth. The thickness of the enamel and dentin of primary teeth is approximately half of that of permanent teeth. The enamel rod direction in the cervical area is angled occlusally compared to the apical direction in permanent teeth. Crowns of primary teeth are characterized by significant cervical constriction both in the mesiodistal and facial lingual dimension. The primary molars have a pronounced buccal cervical bulge. The contact areas of primary molars are flat and very broad buccal lingually compared to the permanent molars, and the crown color of primary teeth is whiter in a lighter shape. The roots of primary molars have a greater flare. This allows a combination of the developing crowns of the succedaneous permanent premolars of the permanent dentition. The mesiodistal width of the root of the primary anterior teeth is much narrower than the crown when compared to the permanent anterior teeth. The primary molar roots are relatively longer and more slender, meaning that the mandibular molar roots are narrower mesiodistally. Maxillary mesiobuccal and distobuccal roots are narrower mesiodistally, and maxillary palatal roots are narrower buccolingually. Pulp and root canal systems. The size of the pulp relative to the crown is larger in the primary teeth. Pulp horns are higher in proportion and are located closer to the dental enamel junction and to the outer surface of the crown. Mesial pulp horns are higher than the distal pulp horns. Pulp chambers are shaped comparable to the shape of the outline of the crown from the occlusal view. Pulp horns are present under each cusp of the primary molars. The pulp chambers of primary mandibular molar teeth are normally larger than the pulp chambers of primary maxillary molars. The root canal systems of fully developed primary molars are extremely torturous and complex. From the same study, here's the practical information. These are CT scans, a 3D model in the x-ray, primary central, lateral, and cuspid teeth. You can appreciate starting from the central incisor. As you move more apically, there is a more ovoid apical portion when compared to the lateral and the cuspid that are more circular in nature as you're moving from the coronal portion to the apical portion. Another thing to appreciate is in the more coronal pulp area, the central incisor has wider and larger pulp tissue in the more coronal portion in the mesial pulp horn and the distal pulp horns concerned to the lateral and the cuspid. So all of that that is very important when you're considering anterior pulpectomy and making sure that your access is removing all of the coronal pulp tissue structures. And as you move farther apically, bearing in mind that in central incisors, you can have very ovoid apical structures versus the lateral and the cuspid that are more circular and constricted in nature. This is also a very helpful chart from this same study, and what we're going to focus on are the maxillary teeth root lengths. We can take a look at the primary maxillary central incisor that has an average root length of 10.8 millimeters in the lateral, 10.9 millimeters, and the cuspid is 12.8 millimeters. This is helpful when estimating or using an apex locator as far as determining root length. Now we're going to get into the actual case. The first step that we're going to do is our incisal reduction. One of the more common mistakes that people make with anterior zirconia crowns in the incisal reduction is they don't reduce enough or they don't completely reduce 
from mesial to distal. In this instance, we're using a tapered coarse diamond burr where the depth cut is going to be about a millimeter, which is where the shank meets the cutting portion of the burr where the weld is placed. And this is important because if you don't have adequate incisal reduction from the beginning, you're gonna struggle in the end portion when you're starting to fit the appropriately sized crown and it's not going subgingival enough or you don't have the correct size picked out. Our next step after we finish the incisal depth reductions are our facial depth cuts. One of the common mistakes here, similarly to the incisal reduction, is not reducing enough in the depth cut. And that leads to gross under preparation of the crown. So when you go and try on or size your zirconia crown, finding that the appropriate size for the case is not fitting because you've under reduced. After the facial depth cuts are completed, you're going to take that same amount of burr and go in approximately on the mesial and distal aspects. Another common mistake here again is to not use the full depth or width of the burr to remove the appropriate amount of tooth structure. I would say this is probably the most critical error when doing preformed zirconia crowns and what requires a lot of them to fail or require pulpotomy or pulpectomy is the over tapering or under tapering of the path of draw of the tapered diamond. These preps really do need to have some type of resistance in retention form which makes it very important to hold your burr along the vertical axis of the tooth to make sure that only the taper from the actual burr or a very small amount of taper is applied to your overall preparation. Then we're going to blend those reductions and smooth all of our line angles. This is where over tapering your burr can cause issues. So in the video you can appreciate me blending the facial depth cuts and reduction planes and then starting to blend my interproximal slices as well. Trying to hold the burr as straight up and down as possible along the long axis of the tooth. One thing that I like to do during these preparations is to continuously evaluate and assess how I am orienting my burr to make sure I'm only allowing a minimal amount of taper. The next step is going to be blending or removing the cingulum. I feel like this step is one step that really is different from patient to patient because you have to assess the prominence of the cingulum. One of the critical errors people tend to make here is to take either the football burr or whatever burr they're utilizing and over reducing the lingual aspect of the incisor versus the actual cingulum. And that's important to keep that burr as upright as possible or to set a very slight inclination to only remove the cingulum portion. After that step, we're gonna blend our entire prep and then get ready to try on our pink try-on crowns to assess for our right size. This is what we're looking for. If you can appreciate a slight shoulder that goes 360 around the primary tooth, that is going to be removed, that bevel or shoulder, once we get our final fit size. When you're trying your fit size, it should seat very passively at the margin that you've created. If you can appreciate on these, I made my margin as equal or close to the gingiva as possible. That's going to get me to the closest or the correct final sizing as possible versus having to alter my prep significantly after I've removed that shoulder or margin. The benefit of the shoulder and margin as well is that it keeps you within this tooth structure to help try to preserve the gingival tissue. And that's what we hopefully want to see that these crowns are just sitting right at that margin 
margin. If it's encompassing or going over that margin, then they're too large. Next, we're going to access E and F for the pulp ectomies. When I access for pulp ectomies, I have a more incisal access. That preserves as much lingual or facial tooth structure as possible. And what I try to do is I try to mimic the crown and pulp form of the tooth. So central incisors, as we discussed previously, as you start from the incisal portion and move apically, have a more ovoid presence than laterals and cuspids do. So you're going to appreciate that my axes are a little bit more ovoid in nature from mesial and distal in order to try to make sure I capture all of the mesial and distal pulp horns that are projecting into the crowns. Here are my final prep outline forms, and you can appreciate the more ovoid mesial to distal preparation outline form in my access that is more incisal in nature. And these pulpectomies are going to be using black brooches. You're not doing a lot of cleaning and shaping in these tooth structures. You're really just removing the necros tissue or the hyperemic pulp. This is really just a reminder that there's multiple ways to do pulpectomies and the current research does not support a single way. I have used black brooches and I have also utilized rotary files for pulpectomies. I find the rotary files are easier and quicker to do the pulpectomy and the pulpal debridement. So here I'm going to irrigate E and F with 3% individually packaged sodium hypochlorite by Vista Apex. I think what's important here is to be very mindful to use a side venting or side board needle and also that you do not have to use sodium hypochlorite. As I said previously, you can use sterile water, chlorhexidine, whatever you can use that has shown to be effective to irrigate these canals. If you see I'm moving the needle up and down to make sure that I'm not binding and I'm also only in the coronal one-third of the actual access and I'm not going very far apically down. After irrigation, I'm going to enter the canal with coarse paper points. I like to use larger paper points to make sure that I don't displace the paper point out of the apex of the tooth. That would initiate more bleeding. So I'll tend to group them in twos or use them upside down or use a thicker end to allow for absorption of whatever um, irrigant that you placed inside the canal. This is what you'd want to see prior to placing your obturant. You would want to see dry canals and your paper points coming out dry. Remember when when we go to place our obturant, there really isn't an ideal medicament. You can use a calcium hydroxide, a calcium hydroxide and iodoform paste. You can use ZOE or you can use the product Endofloss, which isn't available in all locations or countries, which tended to show a higher success rate in the pulpectomy study that I mentioned earlier. So here I'm using Diapex, which is calcium hydroxide and iodoform, to obtund and obturate the canals. One thing that I do is I want to make sure as I fill it, if you notice, it's coming out of the orifice. And I like to make sure that it's coming out of the orifice as I fill to make sure that I'm not pushing it out of the apex. I want to make sure that I get a nice full fill and I slowly pull out my tip. Should obtund your access. Here I am using Tempit, a calcium sulfate and zinc oxide temporary material. You shouldn't use Tempit on vital pulps, but you can use it to a ton pulpectomies where there is no vital pulp tissue. And I want to make sure I fill my access and remove the excess. So here's the radiograph after my super gingival zirconia preparations before moving my chamfer or shoulder. And also you can appreciate the fill of the calcium hydroxide and iodoform diapex paste. I'm also going to go back and clean out the abscess with some sterile water. So here I am using a curette in a Fraser style suction to curette the infection and any sort of excess diapex that got in and then irrigating it with sterile water.
Finally, we're going to take a flame-shaped diamond burr and then go around and remove the shoulder or chamfer around our preparations so we have a feathered edge, smooth margin as we transition from the super gingival to sub gingival portion. One of the biggest critical errors in this is over tapering or under tapering causing an undercut, causing an excessive taper that does not allow for adequate retention and resistance form of the preparation. Once that's completed, we're going to do a final fit testing of our pink try-on crown. This is to ensure that we have successfully removed the sub-gingival margin in that. We have essentially created a cylindrical prep that will accommodate the crown that we initially tried on. If you made a critical error of over-taping your preparation, you'll find here sometimes that the crown forms will not seat adequately. From here, I would assess your preparation, checking for line angles that need to be straightened, and additionally, surveying 360 around your preparation for undercuts for over tapered line angles and straightening those preps. For hemostasis I'm going to use 2% lidocaine 1 by 100,000 epinephrine to blanch the tissue to allow for hemostasis for cementation of the crowns. I think this is helpful than using ferric sulfate or some other aluminum chloride or tertiary bleeding agent that could potentially uptund the open dentinal tubules prior to cementation. So when cementing these, I'm going to be using Biosem by New Smile. An equivalent product would be Fuji Sem Evolve. You can use whatever cement works for you, but please make sure you're following the instructions for use and understand the limitations of the cementation product and how it relates to prefabricated pediatric zirconium. immediate post-operative result. One thing I like to focus on is try and stay within the preparation of the margins that you created, which I think overall preserves the gingival tissue as you can appreciate compared to ENF. This is my six month post-operative visit. You can appreciate the soft tissue healing of the periapical abscess. And also, if you can look at D and G, one thing you can appreciate on Diaz and David is a little bit of plaque accumulation along that marginal gingiva, something that you don't really get to see on the pediatric zirconia crowns. This is because these crowns are very highly polished and actually inhibit plaque accumulation. Circling back, a primary tooth pulpectomy can be a good treatment option in a primary tooth that is necrotic or hyperemic. Appropriate case selection and utilization of current literature and research can help increase success of this treatment option. Mm -hmm.